I know that was a kid's book, but uh, I had to practice reading it through a couple times because I got choked up every time I did. Because the beautiful message of the way that God loves each and every one of us. Hey, I'm busy right now, buddy. I'll talk to you after church. All right, well, hey, if you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and turn to two different places today. Psalm 23 and Matthew chapter 1 are the two passages that we'll be looking at today. Again, that's Psalm 23 and Matthew chapter 1. And I wanted to start out today by asking you a question that probably you've been hearing a lot lately. And that question is, what do you want for Christmas? This is the question that my parents have been asking me. And when you're a kid, you have a whole list of all of the things that you want. When you're an adult, you say, I don't know, world peace, something small like that maybe would be nice. Uh, but I was asking my son that about a month ago, saying, hey, Ethan, what do you want for Christmas? And uh, he's like, Dad, I, I want a, a rubber lizard. And I'm like, what about like a guitar? You know, like, we could get you a guitar. It'd be really sweet because he's going to turn six next month. And I'm a guitar player, and I want to get him a good guitar. I have these little Martins that are really great. And so I'm like, we could get you a guitar, and you and I, we can play together. We're going to have fun. We're going to develop skills that we can use for the rest of your life. Like, you want a guitar. It's going to be really incredible. And he's like, no, Daddy, I want this rubber lizard. And he shows me, and it's a $6 rubber lizard. I could buy him hundreds of lizards for the price that I would have spent on a guitar for him. But what he wanted, well, he was selling himself short on what it was that I wanted to get him. And uh, I ended up getting him a $6 lizard. He's not paying attention, so it doesn't matter. And not a guitar. Why? Because I got him what it was that he asked for. I got him what it was that he wanted. I got him what it was that he was looking for from me. I wanted to give him something more, but I ended up giving him and meeting him at the place of his expectation. So the question for us all as adults, as preteens, whatever you might be in here today, is... What do you want for Christmas from your Heavenly Father? What is it that you're looking for from God? What is the thing that you really need? Well, some of you might be thinking, I need advancement in my career, or I need to get through the finals that are coming, or, or I guess you're done with finals. I need to get through whatever else it is. Maybe it's a relationship, maybe it's a health thing, but there are things that you think that you need, and this is what you're asking God for. And it might be fine to be asking God for these things, but are you selling yourself short on what it is that he really wants to give you, what he really wants to bless you with through Christmas? King David was someone who had a good understanding of the heart, the nature, and the character of God. He understood what it was that God wanted to give him. He understood the life that God wanted to give him, and that's really what God is doing. He's building our lives. He's giving us a life and David understood what the life was that God wanted to give to him. And he describes this in Psalm chapter 23. And maybe it's not a passage that you would typically associate with a Christmas message, but I think it really ties in well. Because in this, we're going to see what it is that God wants to give to us. And he begins by saying, The Lord is my shepherd. Good news, all of you. You always wanted a shepherd. Well, you have one in Jesus. Uh, you're probably thinking, I don't need a shepherd. I have no sheep. I don't need a shepherd. Well, a shepherd was uh, an analogy that the royalty would often use. So if you were a king in the ancient times, you would, re you would describe yourself as being a shepherd to your people. I am a wise, I am a good, I am a mighty shepherd. I will provide for you everything that you might need. If you follow after me, you will have provision, you will have care. Really, our politicians are doing the same things today. They're making lots of promises that they will never deliver on, and the promises they do deliver on, we usually wish they hadn't. But what they do is, like, if you follow after me, there's something that I'm going to give you. There's a blessing that comes from following after me. So when David says that the Lord is my shepherd, he's making a political statement. He's saying that God is the one who is my king, that the great and mighty God, the one who's all-powerful, the one who spoke everything into being, the one who nothing is impossible for, this is the one who is my king. He's the one that I'm looking to for everything I need. He's the one who has the ability to be my provision. He's the one that is everything. And it's not just that he is a high and mighty king who's removed from the masses. I'm not just another you know, part of the electorate process to this king. But he says, not that the Lord is a shepherd. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. That There's a personal relationship there. 
He's not just a shepherd or the good shepherd, the great shepherd. The Lord, God, he's my king. I know the king. The king knows me. There's love that exists between us. He knows who I am. He knows my concerns. He cares for me. That's who God is to me. He's my king. And then it continues on. It says, I shall not want. Now, David was someone who knew what it was to want. He lived in palaces. He lived in deserts. He was loved by the people. He was despised and rejected by the people. People sung his praises. People tried to kill him. He knew what it was to have a lot, but he also knew what it was to have wants for things that he didn't have. And that's true for all of us. And unfortunately, what's happened is this has been perverted a lot of times. Other churches that say God wants to materially bless you and pour out lavishness on you. It's a sign of his love for you or your faith. That's not what this is speaking about. When it says that he... Um, I shall not want, what it means is that I shall not have a need for any of the necessities that I need to continue to do what God has called me to do. Even when David was living in the cave, and he knows that I'm called to be the king over the nation of Israel, but I'm living in the cave instead of the palace, but he still is able to say, I don't have any want because everything that I need to do what God has called me to do to live in the place that God has called me to live, I have everything that I need. There is no lack of provision for me. My God, my King, is the God of provision. I don't have to look to anyone else or to anything else to be my provision. It's because of God, my good and great King, that I have no need for any of the necessities of my life. One of the things that God wants to give you is to be your King relationally, but also to provide you with all of the necessities for your life. He continues on and he says, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. And green pastures, what that means is the place where the sheep would go and they would be able to eat and they would get fat. Like, and it's not that God wants us to eat and get fat, but it speaks to the abundance of life that God provides for you. That he's going to take you to the green pastures. He's going to put you in the place where your life is able to thrive, where his call, his plans, his purposes for your life are all able to thrive. And it's not just that you accidentally find you're there. What the terminology means is that our king is actively searching out these places. God doesn't exist in, in the confines of time. We don't know what lies ahead for us, but he does. He sees into our future. He knows the places, and he's actively searching out and finding the places for you, the green pastures where you will be able to thrive in the life that he's called you to. And it continues on, and it says, He leads me beside still waters. And what that's speaking to is rest. Calm waters are always a symbol of peace, tranquility. It's rest for our minds, for our bodies, for our soul, for our emotions. It's a rest that encompasses everything. It leads us out of anxiety, nervousness, and leads us to the place of complete rest. That's one of the gifts that God wants to give to us. It's a part of the life that he wants us to receive from him. It means that it's protection from the enemies. The places of the still water was always a place where you would be safe from those that would come and try to, to conquer you or to take from you, to harm your life. That's part of the imagery of the still waters. Uh, it's also an image of the, lifting of, divine, of the lifting of the threat of divine punishment. I meet a lot of people who I'll invite to church. I'm like, oh, I can't go to church. Lightning will strike or the place will burn down or whatever. And they laugh, and it's a joke. I get it. But for a lot of people, there's something more than just a joke that's going on. It's this recognition that if God is just and that if God is holy, if he really is good, then someone like me needs to avoid him. Because I'm not good, I'm not just, I'm not holy, I've done things, things have been done to me. The last thing I want is to be in the presence of a holy God because he will pour out his judgment or his wrath on me. That's what I deserve from God. But that's not what God's revealing is what he wants for you. What it's saying is that there's the lifting of the threat of divine punishment. Is saying that God's plan for you, his will for you, isn't that you would stay running away from him or hiding from him because you're afraid of being punished by him because you don't measure up to his standard. It's him saying, I'm lifting that threat. You don't have to fear my retribution. You don't have to fear my punishment when you come and you enter into the life that I have called for you. It's the life that I want to provide for you where you're not hiding from me any longer. And that's the natural reaction in our hearts 
when we know that we're doing things that grieve the heart of God, we want to avoid him and, and stay away from him at all costs. But he's calling us in. He's saying, don't be afraid of punishment from me. Come, I want to give you rest. I want your mind, your body, your soul, your emotions, I want all of it to be in a state of rest. That's the blessing that I give to you. That's the gift of the life that I want to give to you. And then it says, he restores my soul. And this is really the summation of, of what it means to have the green pastures and the still waters, is that we feel depleted. Like life, what it does is it depletes you. But what Jesus does is he comes and he restores you. He restores you back to the way that you were always created to be. He restores you back to relationship to himself. He restores the dreams and the hopes that you had in life. He restores everything about you. Your soul is found to be fully restored in the life that God has for you. That's a part of the gift that he wants for you to have this Christmas. It says, he leads me in paths of righteousness. This is one of my favorite parts. My concern growing up was always, God, I don't, am I messing up? Like, am I missing out on the life that you've called me to? I want to live a righteous life. I want to follow after you. I believe that you have plans and that you have purposes for my life, but I don't know what they are or even the ones that I think I have an inkling of. I'm going to mess it up because I don't know how to get to that place that you've called me to or that place that I'm hoping that you're taking me. One of the biggest questions I get from people is, what's God's will for my life? How do I do this? How do I do that? What does God want me to do? This verse is a beautiful verse for you if you find yourself in that place because it says that he leads me in paths of righteousness. Not, I'm on my own and I have to figure out on my own how to walk a righteous life. It says that he's going to be the one who leads you into the path of righteousness. He's going to be the one who leads you into the green pastures. He's going to be the one who leads you to the still waters where you find restoration of your soul. You know how you get there? You follow him. Part of the gift that God gives to you at Christmas is that you don't have to make your own way in life. You don't have to live with worry, with fear, with trepidation. Am I screwing this up? Am I messing things up? Have I disqualified it? How do I know where God's taking me? You don't have to know. Sheep don't have to worry about where the shepherd's taking them. They just follow the shepherd and trust that he knows where he's taking them and that he's good and that he's able to get them to that place. When I discovered that, what a weight came off of me and what joy returned to my relationship with God because I knew that he was so good that he was taking me to that place. All I had to do every day was wake up, not even knowing what that day held, but knowing that I was going to follow after Jesus that day and that he would lead me in the path of righteousness. He continues on and he says, and he does this for his name's sake. Now, that can be read to say, like, Jesus is doing this because he has to, because it's for the sake of his own name he has to do that. It's a pride thing. No, that's not what that's saying at all. What it's saying is that we know that we can trust God to do that because of his name. He is faithful. The name of Jesus has never failed. God has never been unable to deliver on any of his promises. God has never come across a situation that was too hard for him of where he didn't know what to do. He's never come across someone who was too far away from him that he couldn't call them back and wash them and make them his own. Because of the name of Jesus, the untarnished record that's associated with the name of Jesus, we can put our trust in him because it's for his name's sake that we have a hope that's found in him that he's going to lead us into this life. But then David says this, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Jesus, what David's doing now is he's being real. He's saying, this is the place that God's taking me to. He's taking me to green pastures. He's taking me to the place of the still waters. He's restoring my soul. He's leading me on the path of righteousness. But the reality is, life won't always feel like you're in the green pasture. Life won't always feel like you're living beside the still waters. Sometimes the path that Jesus is leading you on to get to that place will take you through the valley of the shadow of death. Sometimes following after Jesus and following after him so he can take you to that place, he can develop your heart, he can develop your character, do different things inside of you, sometimes that means that you go through the place 
or where fear is going to come against you. Sometimes it means that you go through the place of where financially you're ruined, relationally you're ruined, uh, your health can be ruined, whatever it might be. You might feel like the dream has died. You might feel distance from God. You might wonder if you've disqualified yourself. All that you hear, you don't hear the voice of the goodness of God, but instead you hear the voice of the enemy who's just speaking fear into you that's telling you that there's no way that you can get out of this this is the place of your death, whether it be a physical, relational, emotional, the death of a dream, whatever it might be. But sometimes in our life, we're going to walk through that valley where death is all that we can see and fear is going to rise up inside of us. But this is what David says, that even as we walk through that place, we don't have to fear evil. We don't have to live a life that's controlled or dominated by fear. We don't have to give in to the other voices. We don't have to lose hope. We can still trust in God, and the reason why we can do that is because you are with me. This is really the linchpin of everything that God wants to do for you. It's the linchpin of the gift that he wants to give to you. The reason why we can have this life where Jesus is our king, where he's leading us in the green pastures, where we're drinking from still waters, where our soul's being restored, where we're following the path of righteousness, where we're walking through the valley of the shadow of death without fear of any evil. The reason why we can live that kind of a life is because of the gift of God with us. And that's the gift of God. It's the gift of God with us. It's the message we read all through scriptures. That's what God spoke to Jacob as he was going into his dark days. He says, I am with you. It's the message that he spoke to Joshua as he's moving into the promised land against insurmountable odds. I am with you. You don't have to be afraid. It's the message that he spoke to Jeremiah when he called him and he was afraid. He said, I am with you. It's the message of the book of Isaiah. As the people of Israel find themselves exiled, as they find themselves occupied and oppressed, he says, but I'm still with you. You don't have to lose hope. You don't have to be afraid because I am with you. It's the message of the book of Haggai. It's the message of the early church as those who put their faith in Jesus in the first three centuries following the resurrection. It was a death sentence for you. And they went through unbelievable persecution, but they didn't fear. And they continued to live with peace and joy. And their rallying cry was that God is with us. And it's the message of Christmas itself. It says this in Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 23. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man, unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. What we celebrate at Christmas is the gift of Jesus, the gift of God with us. So I'll ask you again, what do you want for Christmas this year? Have you been selling God short on what he can provide for you? Have you been pursuing after rubber lizards? Have you been giving up on the great thing that you really need? Even the gift of Christmas is the gift of a king. That you can know God deeply, intimately, relationally. It's the gift of a life that's thriving, not just getting by. It's the gift of freedom from sin. It's the gift of rest for your mind, your body, your soul. It's the gift of restoration. It's the gift of walking through the darkest days of your life knowing that God is with you. It's the gift of knowing that you don't have to live with anxiety, trying to figure out your way through life, 
but knowing that he's the one who's going to lead you into the fullness of all his plans and all of his purposes for you. It's the gift of God with us that we don't have to live separated from God anymore, but he's here now, and he's wanting you to receive this gift from him. It was a costly gift. For you to receive God with us, it meant that Jesus had to leave the glory of heaven where he is worshipped and adored for all time by all of creation. And he humbled himself to take on human flesh, to become fully God and fully man. It meant that he went through everything that we go through. He was born into a persecuted, occupied people. He was poor. He was despised. He was rejected even by his own family and his own friends. He got sick like we get sick. He experienced sorrow like we experience sorrows. He went through the fullness of the human experience, but never sinned. And he went to the cross on our behalf, knowing that the punishment for our sins was death. It was separation from our God who loves us, the one who's the source of our life, the one who brings us to life. But he took all of our sins upon himself on the cross so that we could be redeemed, so that we could be restored, so that the barrier that separated us from God would be completely removed, so that now by faith we can receive the gift of God with us. It's the gift that God has for you this Christmas. And he's desperate for you to receive it. But he'll meet you at the point of your faith and he'll meet you at the point of your expectation. Are you looking for something small from God and insignificant in the grand scheme of things? Or do you want it all? Do you want God with you? Would you stand with me this morning? And every eye closed, every head bowed. It's always so important that we listen and that we respond to what Jesus is doing. Jesus, would you come now in this place? You are the gift of God with us, not just 2,000 years ago, but you're the gift of God with us now, today, and forevermore. We're not just looking forward to you coming one day. You came. Your kingdom is here. And we have the ability to receive from you. Jesus, would you search every one of our hearts? And would you speak to us? God, have we wanted with the thing that we really need from you? I encourage you to ask God this. What do I need from you this Christmas? Do you need him to be your king? Meaning that you bend the knee and say, Jesus, you are God. You are Lord. I'm going to follow after you from this day forward. I repent of my sins, Jesus. I'm following after you. I want to know you. Thank you for the forgiveness of my sins. Thank you that you are my king. Maybe it's that you need the gift of thriving in your life. You need the green pastures where your life can thrive, not just get by. Maybe you need rest. We live in such a busy world. So many things competing for our time and attention. Maybe you just need rest in your mind, your body, your soul, your spirit from God. Emotionally, a release of anxiety, a release of fear of God and divine punishment over your life. Maybe this morning you need some restoration in your soul. Maybe this morning you've been living with fear. You're going through a tough time. You're in the valley of the shadow of death. And there's fear that's speaking to you. It's coming in. It's trying to crush you from both sides. And you need hope to be restored. You need peace to return to you. You need boldness to rise up inside of you. Jesus has the ability to give that to you. Whatever it might be, maybe you just need the gift of God with us. God, I need more of you, more of your presence in my life. I'm going to ask you to respond on the count of three. If there's one of those things that you need in your life, the way that we receive a gift is first we ask for it. And by raising our hands is a symbol of saying, God, I'm asking you for that thing. On the count of three. One, two, three. If you need any of those things, just hands all over the room. Thank you, Jesus, for that. Thank you. And God's getting ready to give you a gift. He 
put your hands down. We're going to pray this together. Father, we love you. Thank you for the gift of Jesus. I put my faith and my hope in you. Forgive me of my sins. Lead me in the path of righteousness. Be my provision. Give rest to my soul. Give me boldness in the valley. And give me more of your presence. I want everything you have for me. And thank you. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. That's awesome. What a gift for Christmas. Well, here's what we're going to do. The ushers are going to come around, and you have some candles that you might have received when you came in. Go ahead and grab those, and we're going to sing Silent Night together. And the ushers are going to go around the outsides of the aisles and light the candle, and then you're going to light your neighbor's, na neighbor's candle. And when you do that, if your candle's on fire, just keep it straight up and down. And let the unlit candle be the one that tips to get it. And we'll sing together. Just continue to worship Jesus and be in awe of who he is and the gift that he's given us. Silent night, holy night, all is cold, all is bright, bounty on virgin, mother and child. nothing more beautiful than light and darkness. It's such a beautiful picture for who Jesus is. The light of the world has come to us. And it's not just that he's come to us, but now that light is in us. I'm looking out at all of you with the candles lit. This is a picture of the kingdom of God. Souls that have been set on fire by the love of Jesus and every one of us carriers of the presence of God, 
called to go into the dark places of this world and illuminate it with the light of the love of Jesus that was so beautifully demonstrated at Christmas. God, use us, we pray. Burn more brightly inside of us than ever before, God. Let there be passion that stirs up in our hearts for you like we've never known before because we've seen your beauty. We've found you to be worthy. We believe that you're the one who is our king and we want the life that you've called us to. We want the life of God with us. God, thank you for that promise and we take hold of it today and we want to live more fully in that than ever before. God with us, God with us, we pray. In the name of Jesus, amen. And you can go ahead and blow out your candles. I always felt so bad doing that as a kid, like I blew out the light of God. I realized <laughs> it's here, it's in us. That's why I was the world's worst acolyte. At the, the ushers are going to have a little receptacle you can drop your candles off in on your way out. This is what I encourage you. We'd love to pray with you. If, if you're in a place right now where you need peace, you need rest, you need a salvation, you need whatever it is that God has for you. We love, as everybody else is leaving, to have you come forward. I'd love to pray with you and some of my prayer team. We want to see God do miracles in your life. And he's so passionate about it that he came to you to do it. If not, go drink some coffee, some hot chocolate, meet some friends. Merry Christmas, God bless, and we'll see you next week.